Hi, and welcome to part two of Lola Rose by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from chapter three, Running Away. I stared at Mum. How can we run away? Easy, I've still got the £10,000 in my handbag. Well, we're about 50 quid down because of the meal, but never mind. Thank God I didn't give it to him for that stupid car. Okay, okay, I'm the big stupid. I said he'd knock some sense into me, and he has. He has. I'm not having him using you as a punch bag, kiddo. Come on, then. You're up for it, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course I am, but he'll go berserk when he finds us. He won't. We'll get right away. You and me and Kenny. A completely fresh start. So come on, pack a bag, just a little one you can carry, and do one for Kenny, too, while I go through all my stuff. Mum, this isn't a game, is it? Do I look like I'm playing a blooming game, said Mum, wiping her nose again. He'll be down the pub still till closing time, but we want to be well away by then. So come on, Janie, jump to it. So I jumped. I ran into our bedroom and snapped on the light. I looked weird in the mirror. One side of my face bright red where Dad had hit me, one side chalk white. Kenny blinked in the sudden bright light and tried to pull the duvet over his head. No, Kenny, we're getting up. Come on, you've got to get dressed. But it's night time. Yes, but we're going out again. With Dad? No, just you and me and Mum. I hauled him out of bed and hugged his little squirmy body hard. And you're going to be a big boy, a big, big boy and help. Kenny reached out and touched my red cheek. Ouch. Will it get right again, said Kenny. Of course it will. Now, I stood him on the floor and looked at him. He was still wearing his t-shirt and pants and socks. I had a brainwave. I rummaged in his drawer. Put these on, okay? I said, thrusting more pants and socks at him. Over the other ones? And another t-shirt. And there's your red jumper. You like that? And the blue Thomas and tank the tank engine one. And your jeans. We'll have to pack a, a spare. A spare pair. We'll never get another lot on over the top. Kenny started giggling hysterically as I shoved as many clothes on him as I could. He waddled about so comically, I couldn't help laughing too, though my heart was going thump, thump, because I was so scared Dad might come back and catch us. What are you kids laughing at? Come on! Mum called urgently. I set Kenny to packing his favourite toys in his school bag and started on my own clothes. It was easier for me. All my stuff was getting too small and tight and made me look far too fat. I hated nearly everything. I was already wearing my favourite outfit, my purple velvet skirt and my black grown-up top. I shoved a big black cardi on over the top and then my horrible padded white jacket, which made me look like a snowman. But never mind, I could get the denim jacket now we had lots of money. I packed my underwear and my jeans and my pink top with the hearts and my suede boots, which rubbed a lot, but I still loved them. Then I remembered my pyjamas and my old bear Pinky was tangled up inside them. All her furs worn smooth and shiny, and she's lost an eye which gives her a lopsided expression. She's really tatty now, and I'm too old for teddies anyway, but I still crammed her into my bag. Kenny was making even sillier choices, shoving a yo-yo without any string and broken crayons and a jigsaw set with half the pieces missing into his school bag, but forgetting his new wax crayons and little Bob, the blue bear he's had since he was born. I repacked for him and then jiggled my own stuff around packing a big carrier bag with my scrapbook and my new magazines and scissors and sellotape and prit. We're done, Mum, I said, going into her bedroom. She looked as if she was in fast forward, rushing around like crazy, ransacking her wardrobe and her chest of drawers. Her nose still wouldn't stop bleeding. It made a garish trail past her lips, down her chin, dripping onto her blue top. Your best blue top, Mum. It'll wash out. It'll, well, I'll leave it on, though it looks a mess. Should I just dump it? Mum stood still, suddenly freeze-framed. Put a sweater over it. I've got Kenny wearing half his clothes, I said. You're a clever kid, said Mum. She didn't think me so clever when she saw my carrier bag. You can't drag that along too, Janie. It was one of those big, strong 15-pence supermarket carriers, but my scrapbook only just fitted inside. It's a huge, old-fashioned accounts book with hundreds of pages. I bought it for a pound two years ago at a car boot fair. It is my most valued possession. Mum knew this, but she still argued. You can't take that great big thing. Not when you've got your own bag. And you'll probably have to carry Kenny's too. I'll carry it all. I promise. I have to have my scrapbook. You could start a new one. I need this one. It's got all my best ever pictures. I have to take it, Mum. Oh, for God's sake, do as you're told, Mum shouted. And then she stopped, her hand over her mouth. We heard footsteps walking along the balcony towards our flat. He's back, Mum hissed. And we clutched each other. But the footsteps went past our front door and on down the balcony. Mum breathed out and tapped her hand over her heart. Then she gave me a quick pat on the shoulders. OK, OK, take the bloody scrapbook. Let's just get out of here, quick. She got her suitcase and her handbag, still wadded tight with five pound notes. 
We hung Kenny's heavy satchel over his small shoulders. I grabbed my own school bag and the scrapbook carrier. We looked around the flat one quick last time. Kenny suddenly wailed that he wanted to take Bubble, our goldfish. I promised him he could have a whole tank of tropical fish in our new place that Kenny wouldn't be diverted. He started howling, his arms around Bubble's bowl. Oh God, what next, said Mum. She poured some water into a polythene bag and tipped Bubble into it. Okay, he's coming too, she said. Now, let's go. So we went, staggering along the balcony and down in the lift. I was terrified we'd walk out and bump straight into Dad, but there was no sign of him or any of his mates. They'll still be in the pub with any luck, said Mum. Still, the sooner we scarper, the better. A taxi drew up down the road and three old ladies got out, back from their bingo. Hey, hey, taxi, Mum yelled. She nodded at me proudly, as if she'd summoned it up herself out of thin air. The taxi driver shook his head at us as we hobbled towards him. He shook his head again when he saw Mum's bloody nose. Do you want the hospital, love? No. The railway station, please, Mum said, briskly. She wiped her nose. Walked straight into a lamppost, didn't I? The taxi driver raised his eyebrows, but didn't comment. My cheek had calmed down now, though it still hurt. My teeth felt funny too. I hoped they weren't going to fall out. Still, it might make my cheeks look hollow. I hated my fat face. The taxi driver was peering at Kenny in his bag. What you got there, son? Is it a baby shark? No, it's a goldfish, said Kenny. It's never, said the taxi driver. Well, I'm not supposed to carry no livestock. That's what a goldfish is, livestock. <laughs> so... He'll have to swim his own way through the puddles to the railway station, right? Kenny's face crumpled. He's joking, Kenny, I said, pushing him into the taxi. I didn't mean to set him off, it's just my funny way, said the taxi driver. That's okay, mate, said Mum, getting in after us. But can you kind of step on it? Sure. What time's your train then, he, she, he said. Mum hesitated. Not quite sure, but we're running late, I know that. We set off, round the estate, down the road, right past the Albert, Dad's pub. Mum and I looked at each other. Mum slid down in her seat. I did too, pushing Kenny's head down. You're hurting me, Janie, he complained. Well, scrunch down, Kenny. Go on, right down, I urged. Why? The taxi driver was staring at us in the mirror, sucking his teeth, sussing out the situation. We sat up properly when we were past the pub. Mum peered in her powder compact, wiping her nose and rubbing all the smudged mascara off her eyes. Look, love, I know it's none of my business, the taxi driver started. Yeah, that's right, said Mum, powdering her swelling face. It's obvious your old man's given you a right going over. Why not go to the police? Them, Mum said a very rude word. They're useless when there's a domestic. Oh yeah, they might arrest him, but they're not going to keep him banged up down the station, are they? And he's not going to be very in a very nice mood when he gets back home, is he? Yeah, well, I suppose you've got a point. So, you're doing a runner, are you? You and the kids? I don't want to talk about it, said Mum. She started biting the skin around her thumb. Not in front of the, front of the kids, eh? I knew this was just a ploy to get him to shut up, but I resented it all the same. I wasn't a kid, not like Kenny. I knew what was going on all right. I knew as much as Mum anyway. We got to the station and Mum paid the driver. She struggled to hide the contents of her handbag, but he spotted some of the fivers. He raised his eyebrows. Strafe, <laughs> have you just robbed a bank, girl? Wouldn't you like to know, said Mum, standing on the pavement, while I hauled Kenny out and then all our bags. Thelma and Louise all rolled into one, that's me. She put two fingers together and cocked her thumb. Bang, she said, aiming at the taxi driver's head. He laughed and ducked. I'm not arguing with you then, still. Best of luck. Mum gave him extra as a tip. You won't say where you dropped us off if anyone asks, she said. Serious now. The driver ran his finger over his lips to show they were sealed. Mum stared after him as he drove off. Nice guy, that, she muttered wistfully. I could see the story going on in her head. The taxi driver would suddenly turn back, tell us to hop in and take us wherever we wanted. London, New York, Disneyland. He'd look after us and earn money for us and never hit us. That was the story version. In real life, he drove off to join the other taxis at the rank and didn't even give us a wave. Come on then, said Mum, sniffing. She was still wearing her best high heels, twisting her ankles because her heavy suitcase made her walk lopsided. Kenny and I staggered after her. The station was almost empty. My heart stopped thumping again. What if there weren't any more trains? The station would be one of the best first places that Dad would come looking for us. Mum was standing at the information board, running her finger down the train timetable, looking worried. And then she stabbed a line with her finger, suddenly smiling. It's okay. It's leaving in ten minutes. Where are we going, Mum? London. I swallowed. Yeah, but, but where in London? We don't know anyone there. That's right. That's good. Fresh start and all that. Let's get straight on the train. 
We can always pay if the ticket man comes, comes around. That way, there's no record of any transaction at the main ticket office. Mum giggled. I feel like I'm in some cops and robbers film. It's kind of fun, isn't it? She didn't look like it was fun. Her face looked worse in the bright light of the station. Her giggling sounded weird, too much like crying. But she wanted us to agree with her, so I nodded determinedly. Yes, it's like an adventure, Mum, isn't it, Kenny? Kenny was almost out of it, practically sleepwalking, though he managed to concentrate enough to clutch Bubbles' bag. As soon as I'd lifted him onto the train, his head lolled and his, he fell fast asleep. I had a peep at Bubble. He didn't look too happy, but there was nothing I could do about it. We can get Bubble a proper fish tank, can't we, Mum? Yeah, sure. And we'll get lots more goldfish. And what do you call those massive ones that cost a fortune? Koi carp. But they'll be much too big, won't they? So, we'll have a gigantic aquarium with dolphins. No, sharks, I said, baring my teeth. It was mad. We were discussing a proper home for Bubble when we still had no idea where we were going to live ourselves. Mum, when we get to London, where exactly are we going to go? We'll stay in a hotel just until we get ourselves sorted. Yes, but it'll be very late when we get there. What if all the hotels are closed for the night? What if we can't find anywhere? What if... Oh, give it a rest, Janie. You're doing my head in. But shut up, will you? I curled up against Kenny and tried to go to sleep. I couldn't manage it. Everything kept going round and round in my head. Every time I looked over at Mum, I could see they were going round and round in her head too. She was gnawing her thumb. It looked like she wouldn't have any skin left by the time we got to London. Chapter 4. New Names It was easy after all. When we got to the station, the upper crust food store was still open. Mum bought us all a sandwich and asked the woman serving us if she knew if there were any hotels nearby. She drew us a little map on a paper napkin. It turned out there was a whole street of hotels only five minutes away. Though they look a bit seedy, said Mum, when we got there. We're in the money now. We could stay at the Blooming Ritz if we wanted. But Kenny was so out of it, Mum had to carry him on her hip, lugging her case as best she could. It was obvious we couldn't go any further. The first hotel said they were full. No one came to the door of the second hotel, though the hall light was on and we rang and rang. I started to panic then, thinking we were going to stagger around half the hotels in London. Mum said brightly, third time lucky. And it was. A man came to the door and said he had a double room for the night. £45 to be paid now and a fiver each if we wanted a continental breakfast. Mum handed over the money and then signed the register. She's got very big, sprawly handwriting. She swirls every loop and puts little hearts instead of dots over her eyes. But she made her writing little and squiggly in his greasy register, so it was very hard to read. It didn't look anything like Mum's name, Nicky Fenton. Still, the hotel man didn't seem bothered. He didn't even give Mum's sore face a second glance. Her nose was all crusty now. She dabbed at it self-consciously and started some spiel about falling flat on her face because of her silly high heels. But the man didn't seem to be listening. It was like he'd heard it all before a hundred times over. He just handed Mum the keys, pointed up the stairs and went back to watching Channel 5 in his office. Charming, Mum muttered. Well, we won't be stopping here for long. We hauled Kenny and our bags up three narrow flights of stairs and found our room down a dingy corridor. It had hardly any furniture, just a double bed with cigarette burns on the duvet, a wardrobe with only one hanger and a wash basin with a sliver of soap and just one towel. Mum sniffed contemptuously. She gingerly pulled back the duvet, but the sheets were reassuringly white and smelt freshly laundered. Come on, then. Let's get into bed, she said. You get Kenny out of all them clothes while I go and find the toilet. Mum came back with her nose wrinkled. It's not very nice, she said. Watch Kenny when you take him, Janie. Don't let him touch anything. Kenny was half asleep, so he did as he was told, dopily. I found it hard to go myself, not daring to sit on the filthy seat. I just sort of hung in midair, hoping for the best. I distracted myself reading all the rude messages scribbled on the wall. When we got back, Mum was already in bed, her mohair cardi on over her black nighty. Come on, kids, it's freezing in here. We jumped in with her. It was like sliding into snow, but Mum put her arms right tight around us and we all huddled up. It gradually got cosier. We heard some people arguing along the corridor, but Mum pulled the covers right up over our heads so we were in our own cave where no one could get us. I fell asleep eventually, but woke with a start in the middle of the night. I'd been dreaming of Dad. He was chasing after me. I woke up with my heart pounding as if I'd really been running. I reached out for Mum, but she wasn't there. I could only feel Kenny huddled into a little ball, breathing heavily. I sat up, panicking. It was dark in the pokey little bedroom, but I could just make out a shape over by the window. Mum? I slipped out of bed and pattered across the worn carpet. What are you doing, Mum? I put my hand on her arm. She was shivering in spite of her mohair cardigan. Shh, love, don't wake Kenny. It's okay. He's dead to the world, Mum. 
Can't you sleep? Nope. And I've run out of fags, which is a bit of a bummer. I was wondering about going out to look, you know, looking for a machine somewhere. Don't, Mum. Okay. I wasn't very thrilled about the idea myself. Oh, Janie, what the hell are we doing here? Maybe I went a little bit nuts. Your dad wouldn't really start on you. He thinks the world of you, darling. He thinks the world of you too, Mum, but he hits you. Why does he? Search me. I just seem to set him off. I'm, I'm pretty useless, really. Not much cop as a wife or a mum. She started to cry. You're a lovely mum, I said. I put my arms around her. You're not useless at all. You're lucky. You're the only person who's ever won the lottery round our way. <laughs> Lady Luck, mum sniffed. That's what I signed in the register downstairs. L Luck, just in case your dad came snooping. Maybe it's not such a good idea to be so close to the station. This could be the first place he'll look if he comes after us. We'll leave right after breakfast, okay? Is that going to be your new name then, Mum? Lady Luck? Well, Lady sounds a bit daft, doesn't it? I could be Nicky Luck now, though. Or maybe I'll change my first name too. I'll be Victoria. I always like Posh, best of all the Spice Girls. Victoria Luck. Yeah, sounds great, doesn't it? Should we change our names too? Kenny and me? Yes, I think you'd better. What do you want to be then, darling? I thought of all the women in my scrapbook. Brittany and Charlotte and Kate and Kylie. But that didn't work because I wasn't remotely like any of them. I'd edged each picture with lots of cut-out presents for each woman. Flowers and glasses of champagne and boxes of chocolates and bottles of perfume. One of the pictures had the model's name Lola Rose. I tried the name out inside my head and I liked it. I'll be Lola Rose. I stood up straight, tossed my hair, smoothed my nightie. Lola Rose sounded a seriously cool girl. She had long, thick, curly hair. My fine, straight hair seemed thicker and curlier already. Lola Rose had a perfect model figure. I sucked in my tummy and stuck out my chest. Lola Rose wasn't scared of anyone, not even her dad. I breathed out slowly, a little smile on my face. Lola Rose Luck, said Mum. OK, new name, new start. She rubbed her watery eyes, smearing her mascara. Oh, God, look at me. Bum, I didn't pack my cleansing cream or my makeup. We can go shopping, get you heaps more. And I could have some too, I said hopefully. OK, Lola Rose, said Mum, going to the sink to wash her face. She scooped up some water and then shrieked, My God! I'd filled the basin with cold water for Bubble. Mum had fished him out by mistake. He wriggled free and plopped back into the water while Mum and I giggled hysterically. Shut up in there! I'm trying to sleep! Someone called, banging on our wall. Mum and I spluttered some more, hands over our mouths. Kenny woke up too. Where am I? He said, starting to cry. Mum! Janie! Shh, Kenny, we're here, I said, going to him. And you can shut that kid up too, the voice shouted from the other side of the wall. You're the one making all the more noise, matey, Mum yelled. You shut up. Mum, don't. Please don't start a row, I hissed. I had my arms around Kenny, trying to stop him wailing. The voice yelled back something very rude, so rude that Mum and I got the giggles again. Mum got back into bed beside us. We're out of here, first thing, kids, she whispered. We're dossing down amongst some right nutters. You're squashing me, Janie, Kenny complained. Sorry, sorry, but... Don't call me Janie. I'm Lola Rose now. And I'm Victoria, said Mum. Is this a game? Kenny said uncertainly. I don't like it. I want to go home. No, you don't, I said quickly. This is much more fun. We're going shopping later on. We'll buy you all sorts, Kenny. But we're being new people now, so we've got new names. I'm Lola Rose Luck. Cool name, isn't it? And Mum's Victoria Luck. So what name are you going to choose? I'm Kenny, said Kenny. Yeah, but now you can be anybody. Shall I help you? What about Jamie? Robbie? David. Which? I won't remember, Kenny said, looking worried. Yes, you will. How about something like your own name, so it doesn't sound too diffi difficult or different? Lenny? Benny? Could I be Kendall, said Kenny. Kendall Mintcake, Mum spluttered. I felt Kenny stiffen, humiliated. I think Kendall's a cool name, I said. Yeah, right. It's totally cool. Victoria Luck has two cool kids. Kendall and Lola Rose, said Mum, snuggling down between us. Shall we all try and have a little kip now? She cuddled us close. Kenny, Kendall, was quiet. I thought he'd gone to sleep, but then he piped up again. What's Dad going to be called? I waited for Mum to answer. She didn't. Maybe she was asleep. Dad isn't part of our family now, Kendall, I whispered. Why not? Kendall sounded astonished. I couldn't see how he could be so thick. You know why, I hissed. Because Dad's horrible and keeps hitting Mum. He hit me too. It still hurts whenever I move my jaw. He doesn't hit me, said Kendall. Don't you feel sorry he hits mum? But she deserves it, said Kendall. I took hold of his bony little shoulders, threw his t-shirt and shook him hard. How dare you say such a wicked, stupid thing? 
But she does deserve it. Dad says so, Kendall said, starting to whimper. Don't, Janie. You're hurting. I'm not Janie anymore. I'm Lola. Lola Rose. And you're not to say another word about Dad or I'll, I'll get really cross. We hate Dad. No, we don't, Kendall mumbled. We love him. I turned my back on him. I elbowed him away when he tried to cuddle up. I hated him, even though he was right. I hated Dad. He really scared me silly, but I still loved him. I thought of him wandering round our flat all by himself, calling our names, looking in every room, pulling down bed covers, peering in wardrobes. He'd get mad later, fighting mad, but he'd be so hurt too. He'd cry. Our dad was the toughest man on the estate, but I'd often seen him cry. He always cried after he'd hit mum. He'd hold her hands and tell her he was sorry, tears trickling down his cheeks. He'd kiss all her bruises and he'd go down on his knees and beg her to forgive him. And she did. It wasn't just mum. Dad has a way of getting around anyone. When Kenny had a temper tantrum, flat on his back, drumming his heels and yelling fit to burst, Dad would pick him up, laughing. Let's switch off this silly noise, he'd say, pressing Kenny's nose like a button. And Kenny would stop mid-scream and laugh like it had been a joke all along. Dad could get around me too. He'd come and sit beside me and pick up my hand and play with my fingers, calling them funny names. Once he painted each of my little bitten nails the seven colours of the rainbow, and my thumbs and one pinky finger gold, silver and sparkly white. He bought me this little pack of rainbow beads and threaded them onto my plaits while he fed me rainbow dotted chocolate buttons. On my last birthday he gave me a great silver box tied with rainbow ribbon. There were layers of tissue inside so I knew it was a dress. I guessed it would be a rainbow dress and I felt anxious because I'm too big for that kind of party frock. It was beautiful. It was smocking on the front and rainbow stripes, little puff sleeves and a big flouncy skirt. It was the sort of dress I'd have died for when I was about five. It looked awful on me now. It was much too tight, too bright, too babyish. But I had to smile and hold out my skirts and prance around as if I was, as if I was frilled to bits. I had to wear it to the school disco. All the other kids laughed at me. No one wanted to dance with me, so I danced by myself leaping around wildly, pretending to be having fun. I leapt a little too wildly and split my seams. Mum tried to sew them up for me, but the material was ripped and frayed. We hid the dress at the back of the wardrobe so Dad wouldn't see. I thought about him finding it now. I felt as if I were splitting apart, just like my dress. Chapter 5. Seeing the Sights We checked out of that hotel straight after our continental breakfast. Though what's continental about cornflakes and toast and watered-down orange juice, said Mum. What a rip-off. Let's splash out and stay somewhere decent. We chose a big new hotel overlooking the River Thames. Dead classy, said Mum. Don't you let me down, kids. We were given a big bedroom with a huge bed with a pink silky cover that matched the ruffled curtains. And pinky batches too, I said. But when I tucked her under the covers, she looked horribly grey and grubby. We had our own bathroom and a television and a phone and a fridge. Look, we can have lots of drinks, and there's peanuts and chocolates. Wow, said Kendall, rifling through them. Hang on, I don't think they're three, are they, Mum? I said, grabbing his wrists. Yeah, but we're in the money, babe. Let him help himself. Kendall drank a can of Coke and nibbled peanuts, while Mum and I had a bath together. There were dinky little bottles of shampoo and bath foam, so we had the bath brimming with bubbles. We felt just like film stars. You come and jump in too, Kenny. Uh, Kendall, Mum called. We could hear him mumbling away to himself or to someone else. Kendall... I clambered out of the bath, wrapped one of the wonderful big fluffy towels right round me and padded into the bedroom. Kendall was leaning against the dressing table, chatting into the phone. Yes, Dad, it's great in London, he said. I froze. Kenny? He looked startled, then turned his back on me. Only Janie keeps nagging at me, Dad, and I have to sleep in a big bed with her and Mum, and I want my own bed because I'm a big boy, aren't I? He gabbled. Then I grabbed the phone, wrenching it out of his hand so fiercely I bent his fingers back. Ow! Kenny screamed. He tried to hit me with his hand and hurt his fingers more. You told Dad where we are, I said. Then I heard the dialing tone on the phone. Kenny hadn't really been talking to Dad. He'd just been pretending. Unless Dad had put the phone down his end. Were you really talking to Dad, Kenny? Yes, and he said you're very mean to me and he's going to come and get you, see? Kenny shrieked. And anyway, I'm not Kenny anymore. I'm Kendall. For God's sake, Mum called from the bathroom. Stop yelling, both of you. They'll be banging on the walls here. But he was trying to phone Dad. Don't be so daft. He doesn't know how to. He doesn't even know the number properly. I do. I do. I know our number. It's one, two, three, four, sixteen, ten, twenty. See? said Kenny. I did see. I picked him up and gave him a hug, saying I was really sorry I'd hurt his poor hand. Mum got out of her bath, all pink and pretty in spite of the new bruises and her sore nose. 
I dunked Kendall in the water and blew bubbles with him until he'd cheered up. Now, let's get out on the razzle, said Mum. We started off with a second breakfast, pancakes and maple syrup and ice cream. I ate all mine and half of Kendall's, and then ran my fingers around and round the plate to get every scrap of maple syrup. Your manners, Lola Rose, said Mum. Then she stuck out her finger and did exactly the same. I picked my plate up to lick it. Uh, uh, you're going to uh, going a bit too far now, said Mum. Come on then, big great big treat time. We're going on the London Eye. Big treat, big treat, big treat. Kendall sang over and over again until it became meaningless gabble. He whooped with excitement when we pointed out the huge wheel with its glass pods. We watched it revolving very, very slowly. Big treat, big treat, big treat. Kendall gabbled all the time we queued. Everyone smiled at first and said, "Bless him." But eventually, you could see it was getting on their nerves. It was getting on our nerves too. But there's no way you can shut him up when he starts. He big treated right until the moment we went to step into the glass pod. And then he screamed. Kenny, what's up? Said mum. Kendall, I hissed. Come on, it's okay. Step on quick. No, Kenny roared. It's too scary. I had to pick him up and lug him on, carrying him over my shoulder. He kicked and screamed, his square-toed shoes kicking me in the tummy. Cut it out, Kendall. It's lovely, not a bit scary. We will fall. No, we won't. We're in our glass pod. We're going right up high, just like we're flying. Look. Kendall wouldn't look. He stopped screaming, but he stuck his head right inside my jacket and clung tightly. I wanted to get up off my seat and have a proper look, but he moaned whenever I moved. You're a wimp, Kendall, said Mum. Here, Lola Rose. I'll take him for a bit. Thanks, Victoria, I said. It felt as if we were actors because we hadn't quite got used to using our new names. I loved being called Lola Rose. I unhooked Kendall, parking him with Mum. I stood with my face pressed against the glass. It wasn't quite scary enough for me. I wanted to whiz around and around with all London blurring. I wished our glass pod would fly off by itself, whirling us further and further away from Dad. It felt so much safer up here in the bright blue sky. I didn't like it when we were back on the ground again. I kept thinking about Dad, looking over my shoulder. Don't act so twitchy, Lola Rose. It's getting on my nerves, said Mum. Where are we going now, said Kendall. Mum didn't reply. I looked at her. She didn't know. Let's go shopping, I said. We couldn't see any shops, just river and walkways and big buildings. Where are the shops, Mum? Well, kind of over there, said Mum, gesturing vaguely across the river. I suppose we'd better get up on the bridge. So, what are you after, Lola Rose? That denim jacket with fur? And shall we get you your little leather jacket, Kendall? Kendall didn't react. He was breathing deeply, still a bit snuffly after all that screaming. He was staring up at the building beside us. Kendall, have you forgotten that's your name? I hissed. I know, he said, not looking at me. He was staring at the sign on the building. That's the fish word. Aquarium. Yeah, you're right, my lovely, said Mum. Clever little lad. Imagine a little boy like you knowing a big word, word like aquarium. Can we buy some fish to be Bubbles' friends? Yes, we could maybe buy a new goldfish and some food in a proper bowl, I said. Bubble hadn't looked too clever this morning. We'd cleared the bath of Bubbles and left him swimming in his big, po po big pool, but Bubbles seemed very tired. Had a feeling he wasn't going to last much longer. It would be great if Kendall could be distracted with a whole new fishy family. But when we went in, we saw it wasn't the kind of aquarium where you buy fish. It was like a big fish zoo. You just look at these fish, Kendall. You can't buy them. Come on, let's go. I want to look, said Kendall. At a load of old fish, said Mum. Give us a break, Kenny. Uh, a Kendall? It'll be boring. No, we're going to the shops and we'll get you a little leather jacket. Please let me see the fish. Will they have sharks, said Kendall. Sharks, I said laughing. But they did have sharks. I was dawdling along in the dark, peering in at the tanks, without much interest, thinking about denim jackets lined with fur. I wished there were some seats somewhere, as I was feeling really tired now. Mum was holding Kendall up so he could see some slivery creature at the top of the tank. I felt that if you'd seen one fish, you'd seen them all. These ones weren't much more interesting than Bubble. I wandered around a corner and came to a huge tank that took up the whole wall. I leaned against the glass, imagining what it would be like to be a mermaid. I remembered a mermaid cartoon video I watched with Dad ages ago, and then a huge shark swam right past me, jaw open, showing three rows of terrifying teeth an inch away from my nose. I screamed. Mum and Kendall came running. I couldn't stop screaming, though. I covered my mouth with both hands. What is it, Janie? Is it Dad? Did you see him? said Mum, grabbing me. There's a shark, I gasped. Oh, for God's sake, said Mum, giving me a little shake. You give me such a scare. All these Japanese tourists were pointing at me and laughing. You're not scared of fish, are you? said Mum, laughing too. It's a shark, I said. It was so big and so close. It was like it was touching me. 
I'm not scared, said Kendall. I want to see the shark. Where is it? It looks like Lola Rose has frightened it away with all that screaming. Honestly, you're worse than Kendall. Then another huge shark, and another and another, came swimming past, with baleful eyes and huge, sneery mouths. Mum stepped back smartly. Bloody hell, she said, holding my hand. I take it all back. They're whoppers. I like them. Sharky, sharky, sharky. Good boys, come and see me. Open your big mouths. I want to see your teeth. Kendall begged, standing so close his nose was squashed sideways by the glass. Watch out, I called, clinging to Mum. I am watching, said Kendall. They're so lovely. Can I have one, Mum? Please, please, please. All the tourists collapsed with laughter. I laughed too, but I was still shaking. I hated those sharks. I couldn't go near the glass, even though I knew they couldn't swim through it. I wanted to rush past in the next room, but Kenny stuck to the glass like he had little suckers on his hands and nose. When Mum tried to pull him away, he started yelling. You kids are driving me nuts, said Mum. Look, you go to the next bit, Lola Rose. We'll catch up when his lordship has had his fill of the sharks. So I hurried on, round the corner and up the ramp. And then I stopped. I was up at the top of the shark tank now. There was no escape. There they were, swimming straight towards me. I was scared. I was going to start screaming again. I ran and ran, blundering down dark tunnels and through twilight rooms, fish flickering all around me. I shot straight through the aquarium to the gift shop at the end. Even the turquoise toy shark seemed sinister. I lurked in a far corner for ages and ages. I thought Mum and Kendall would never come. When they eventually came through, they were hand in hand, and Kendall was bright pink on the face and beaming. Lola Rose, where did you get to, Mum said. You were so silly, Janie. Sorry, L Lola Rose. This man came and told me all about the sharks. There's this big, big, big one called George. He's the best. George can see ten times better than me, and he smells heaps better too. Yeah, they can smell one drop of blood miles away when they're in the ocean, said Mum, snapping her teeth in a shark imitation. Shut up, Mum. You're not really scared, are you, you big softy? The sharks in these tanks don't eat people. They get fed, like fish paella, octopus and squid and stuff. We'll have to come back and see them fed, won't we, Kendall? Yeah, I want to feed George. I don't think you can feed them, sweetheart. We'll have to watch the man. You should have stayed, Lola Rose. It was fascinating. Mum stared at me and then came up close. Janie, what's all this twitching? What's up with you? You're always so sensible. I am sensible. Sensible people hate sharks because they look so ugly and they can rip you apart. You can take Kendall back if you like, but I'm never setting foot in this place ever again, I said. Not for anything. I walked out of the shop and stood by myself on the embankment. I stared at the river. I knew perfectly well there were no sh sharks in the Thames, but I kept expecting a deadly dorsal fin to streak through the water. When Mum and Kendall came out at last, Kendall was clutching a big fluffy turquoise toy shark. Look, look, I've got my very own George, he cried, racing up to me. Attack, he yelled, whirling George by the tail and then bashing me in the face with him. It didn't hurt. I knew George was a fluffy toy and his teeth were made of felt, but I still screamed. Oh, do stop it, Janie. You're just acting soft to get my attention, Mum snapped. I was so hurt, I went into a sulk. I wouldn't talk to either of them as we crossed the bridge over the river and walked around Covent Garden. Then Mum stopped outside the, this immensely posh French cake and coffee shop. Let's live dangerously, she said, and went inside. I had to talk to say which cake I wanted. It took me ages to choose because they were all so ultra yummy and special. I eventually decided on a cream mousse gâteau with strawberries and a swirl of chocolate icing on top. Mum had an elegant almond croissant. Kendall chose a chestnut cream meringue but he licked it half-heartedly and didn't finish it. So I did. And I had a hot chocolate to die for, all whippy, with a big peak of cream. Mum laughed at me. You've cheered up now, haven't you, Lola Rose? You bet, I said. Then we got startled on some si started on some serious shopping. We found this posh kid's shop, and there was this perfect little black leather jacket that fitted Kendall perfectly. He looked so cute in it. Even the shop assistant clapped her hands and called him a pet. It cost a fortune. But I've got a fortune, said Mum, and she handed over a fistful of notes as if they were pennies. We looked at the girls' jackets too. They had a denim jacket with fur and my heart started beating fast. But when I tried it on, it was much too small. I could hardly get my arms in and I wouldn't meet, it wouldn't meet across my front. I'm too fat, I said, feeling awful. Don't be so daft. You're just getting a big girl, too big for little kids' clothes. You will find you a proper furry denim jacket. Just you wait and see, said Mum. We went into the shop well, shop after shop after shop. Kendall stopped playing swim through the air games with George and started whining. But then in the 13th shop, my lucky number, we found a whole row of ladies' denim jackets lined with fake fur. Cream fur, blue fur, pink fur. I tried the pink furry one on, trembling. It fitted perfectly. 
Well, it was a little too long in the arms, but Mum rolled the sleeves up for me, saying it was the only cool way to wear such jackets anyway. Mum bought it for me, and I went out to the shop wearing it. It felt as if I was being cuddled by the softest teddy bear. I looked great in it, I really did. I kept peering at myself in shop windows. A new cool blue denim, pink, furry-collared Lola Rose stared back, stared back, smiling all over her face. Mum was quite tempted by the denim jackets too, but then she spotted a white leather jacket, short and sexy. When she tried it on, she looked so glamorous, just like a rock star, especially with her dark glasses. We sashayed out of the shop, Lola Rose in her fairy blue denim, Victoria in her rock star white leather, two absolute babes, with a baby, our Kendall, whining for England, dragging George Shark by the tail. We decided to buy him one of his favourite red lollies to shut him up. They proved very good dummies in the past. We could see any number of posh places selling Hagen Dash and Ben and Jerry's, but there weren't any ordinary little corner shops with cheapo ice lollies. Perhaps there's one down a side street, said Mum. We found a little newsagent eventually. He didn't stock Kendall's strawberry shockers, but Mum bought him a fistful of other flavours. Orange, mango, blackcurrant, milk. There, kiddo, suck on that little lot and shut up, said Mum. She bought me a white magnum. I was extra careful eating ice cream in my new denim jacket. I was concentrating so hard on licking cautiously that I almost walked straight past the special shop. It was a bookshop, but these were wonderful books, colouring books, cutout books, sticker books, hundreds of them. Boring, said Kendall, ice lolly all around his mouth like lipstick. Then he saw a colouring book of fishes of the world. He started clamouring for it, even though he goes horribly over the lines when he uses his own wax crayons, and he presses too hard and makes the points furry if I let him near my felt-tip pens. Okay, okay, spoiled brat number two, said Mum, opening up her magic handbag again. What about you, spoiled brat number one? Would you like a fancy colouring book too? I found the book I wanted most of all right at the back of this fairyland shop. It was a fat book of reproduction Victorian scraps, all ready to peel off and stick into a scrapbook. There were hundreds of children in bright pinks and purples, playing with cats and dogs, flowers, birds, seaside scenes, Father Christmas, babies, butterflies, angels. Oh, Mum, Vic uh, Victoria, please, I whispered. We spent that evening sitting up in the double bed together watching television. Mum click flicked through channel after channel. Kendall cuddled up between us, making George swim across the bed and attack poor little Bob the bear again and again. I sat up cross-legged with my scrapbook, balanced on both knees, sticking in my new scraps. My absolute favourites were four enormous angels. They had long golden hair and flowing white robes and great grey wings springing from their shoulder blades. I stuck them in carefully, having to edge them in really close together to fit on the page. When I fell asleep, I dreamed the angels were standing at each corner of our bed, wings spread out like feathery curtains protecting us. And that is where we will leave part two of Lola Rose by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.